on now to our final talk of the session, which will be a tag team between Sihao and Evan. Um, you have 20 minutes total and then 10 minutes for questions. Hello, so my name is Sihao Chang. I'm a fourth year graduate student at uh, Johns Hopkins University. I'm very glad to have this opportunity today to share with you, uh, together with Evan, um, about a, uh, an interesting discovery enabled by Gaia data. So I will cover more on the observational part, and uh, Evan will talk more about the uh, theoretical side. Um, so, um, here I'm showing again the ACE diagram of white dwarfs in a solar neighborhood uh, using Gaia data. The X axis is color, Y axis absolute magnitude. As you can see, there are mainly three uh, branch structures. So the upper two actually are expected and um, are now well understood. The third one actually came as a surprise. That's um, called the Q branch, and this will be the theme of our talk. So uh, the first thing we notice about this branch is that it's an overdensity, it's about two times. So on the branch, the number density is about two times higher than above and below the branch. Um, and also we realize that it's not parallel to any cooling track or isochrone. So that means it cannot be simply explained by a peak in star forming history or a peak in mass distribution. And then, um, People notice that um, this, the position of this branch um, happens to coincide with where crystallization should happen. So what is crystallization? It's the liquid to solid phase transition of the white dwarf material, uh, which will release some latent heat. So it's just like from uh, uh, the melting from, sorry, the, 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 the freezing from water to, to ice. Um, so uh, this crystallization is something people have expected for more than half a century. So that's why um, in 2019, uh, Frank Bertol wrote a paper, a nature paper, uh, uh, proposing that um, crystallization is the physics behind this branch. Um, but actually, there are some problems of these explanations, and mainly there's three reasons. Um, one is that the, the width of the branch is much is narrower. And the 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 the, uh, uh, in, uh, the contrast, the, the number density enhancement is higher than the predict prediction from crystallization, and um, this is actually a in, an intrinsic difficulty of uh, crystallization explanation because crystallization the, the the range temperature range of crystallization is set by the difference of of the pressure in the center and the outer part of a white dwarf that cannot be easily modified. Um, so, so that means crystallization is very hard to explain the narrowness of this branch. And also, uh, at the beginning, when, when Gaia uh, team released their, their results, they've noticed that the, the DQ white dwarf concentrated on the branch. So what is DQ white dwarf? That means in the atmosphere, you have some amount of carbon. So see carbon lines, in the atmosphere. And because the white dwarf structures usually have a very large carbon oxygen core and a very thin uh, layer of helium and then perhaps a thin layer of hydrogen, if you see carbon in the atmosphere, you really need to dredge up the carbon from below the helium layer. So the question is first, why there are these DQ white dwarfs? And second, why they are concentrated on the branch? So put it in another way, why the number density enhancement of DQ white dwarfs are much higher than the number density enhancement of all white dwarfs, which is about two times. And um, the third reason um, is that we check the uh, velocity distribution uh, of these white dwarfs, which finally uh, led us to realize that the Q branch is actually a cooling anomaly so that's not something uh, explainable by, by existing cooling models. So here I'm showing the uh, H diagram again, color coded by the uh, transverse velocity measured from the uh, uh, proper motion and the parallax of, of, of white dwarfs. Um, and if we focus on the high mass part, we see again, and some, some concentration, 
some highlighting the white dwarf with transverse velocity higher than 70 kilometers per second. And they are also concentrated on the ground. So what does that mean? Um, as uh, Josiah just uh, uh, mentioned, in the Milky Way, we have the age velocities person relation, which says that um, because the uh, young stars have a more circular orbit in, 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 in the Milky Way. So relative to the sun, they will have a lower velocity and the older stars have a less circular orbit in the Milky Way. So they have a higher velocity relative to the sun. So if you see these fast moving white orbs relative to the sun, that means they are actually very old. But on the other hand, we see the photometric age inferred from their position on the H diagram is only about one gig year. That's a very big mismatch. And another strange thing is that um, if all the white dwarfs have the same cooling behavior, then the region be below the branch should anyway be older than the region on the branch. So then we would expect the fraction of fast moving white dwarfs below it to be higher than on the branch, but that's not what we see. So we realized that the only way to explain both the overdensity and the velocity axis um, of these uh, Q branch is to have more than one population and more than one cooling behavior. So the simplest scenario is just to have two populations. One have the normal cooling behavior as shown here and as expected, you, you don't see strong uh, features in the, in the cooling uh, flow. But on the other hand, um, we, we assume a special extra delayed population where the white dwarfs uh, cool to the, uh, to, to the position of the cube branch and they need to stop there uh, for, for a very long time and then leave it. And this delay of cooling will create both the number density enhancement and the, the age accumulation. So by fitting uh, the velocity distribution quanti uh, quantitatively, we found that there need to be about 6% of this uh, special population and the delay time need to be eight gig year long. So here's another plot just qualitatively showing uh, how uh, combining these two populations uh, will create some, some uh, uh, velocity distribution similar to what is observed. And, and here's a quantitative uh, result showing that um, these the simple two population scenario can really have a good fit to the velocity distribution observed. So this means this two, two population uh, model is a good phenomenological model. Then the question is, what is the physics behind it? So it can be divided into actually two questions. One is what is the physical mechanism or the energy source inside the white dwarf that can delay a fraction of white dwarf for, for eight gig year long. That's, that's very, something really strange. Another question is what is this special population? What is, whether they're merger or whether they're, what, what is progenitor, for example? To see that um, it, it's actually really demanding. You need the mechanism to, 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 to if affect only a fraction of white dwarfs and need to be very powerful and need to um, have the effect only in, within a thin, very narrow range of temperature, which explains the narrow, narrowness of the branch. So one thing uh, we gradually realized um, is that a Neon 22 actually plays a very important role in this. Um, Evan will talk more about that. And about the population uh, itself, um, I think we now know that it's, it must be carbon oxygen core and also like uh, Holland's found DAQ idols on the branch. That means these populations should have a thin helium layer. And also we realize that um, it seems within this population, there's also diversity of atmosphere types. So there are both the Q idols and DA idols just within this extra delayed population. And also there are connections to hot DQ idols. So we compare the number density of hot DQs and the DQ idols on the branch and seems they are consistent um, that, that they have evolutionary relations. 
So one question is then whether this merger product or not. Um, I think these are still unsolved uh, questions. So it's actually really a challenge to uh, explain still, although we know it's a, a merger that it's, it's a cooling delay, but it's still a real challenge to fully understand it. It's also an opportunity. I think it's a beautiful example showing that how observations can really improve our understanding of uh, astrophysics. So I will then stop sharing and let Evan talk more about the theoretical side. Okay, thanks, Siho. Uh, let's see, okay. So let me bring up these slides. Uh, And let me just double check. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, so like see how said, I'm gonna talk uh, a little more about the, the theoretical understanding that we have so far. And I think there are still some very interesting puzzles to work through, but I think there's been uh, progress and modeling work done over the last year that is, is pointing in some interesting directions. So the, the first thing I wanna emphasize is I think a point we're quickly starting to agree on uh, that this Q branch has something to do with crystallization of massive white dwarfs, um, but not just crystallization of whatever might happen to be there, but actually that it has to be uh, carbon oxygen cores, even though these are fairly massive uh, white dwarfs in sort of the range of one to 1.3 solar masses making up the Q branch. Um, so here, what I'm showing is a, is a plot from the paper that see how also mentioned uh, by Pierre Manuel Tremblay and other collaborators a few years ago, um, showing that this feature really lines up very nicely with, uh, with the crystallization contours that they get in their models. Uh, so just to walk through this really quickly, uh, oh, cursor's gone, that's okay. Uh, these blue tracks are individual white dwarf cooling models. Of course, they start at the top left where they're very hot and very luminous and they cool toward the bottom right. Uh, and if you build up contours of a family of uh, these models where they start crystallization and where they end crystallization, that's what forms these orange dashed curves. Uh, and that kind of brackets where different cooling white dwarfs are undergoing the phase transition from liquid to solid, uh, releasing some latent heat, slowing down in their cooling a little bit, and then uh, going on their way. Um, and so transitioning now to some MESA models that I've made so, uh, for a paper that I published last year. Um, right here, uh, I'm just zooming in on the Q branch feature on the HR diagram. Um, if we color, I think this is the 150 parsec sample, so it's nice and clean. And if we color code the, the points with high transverse velocity that we think are kinematically old, the Q branch really pops out. It's, as C. Howe said, it's very, very distinct, um, a very sharp feature. Uh, and if uh, we make a grid of models. Uh, these now are MESA models just in the mass range of 0 0.9 to 1.2 solar masses. Um, and these have carbon oxygen cores. These are the contours bracketing where crystallization begins and ends. Uh, and we see that lines up really nicely with this very sharp Q-branch feature. Uh, and then what I want to contrast that with is um, oxygen neon white dwarfs. So if I add that here, these dashed curves are bracketing where crystallization occurs for an oxygen neon mixture, and it does not line up at all with the Q branch. Uh, and that's pretty surprising, I think, uh, because uh, naive stellar evolution theory uh, definitely predicts that above about 1.05 solar masses, um, carbon in carbon oxygen white dwarfs uh, or in, in cores that will become white dwarfs should ignite and burn into an oxygen neon magnesium mixture. Uh, and so I think the theoretical expectation for a long time has been that white dwarfs in this mass range would have oxygen neon cores, uh, and that might not be true. And I'm not exactly saying that uh, no massive white dwarf has an oxygen neon core, but I think uh, what I am saying for sure is that the delayed population that makes up this uh, very distinct Q branch feature seems to really need to be uh, carbon oxygen crystallization. Um, so I made that argument in my paper, and I'm not the only one that has made this argument. Maria Kamisasa also has a paper coming out um, where I think she's made a very similar argument based on the Laplata code. So I, th I think our codes are agreeing on this point that there's something uh, very interesting and, and not, totally under uh, uh, not totally explained in terms of our understanding of how these cores are formed for massive white dwarfs. Um, so that's the first point I want to emphasize. And then uh, the next point is really going on to the physics of how to get this cooling delay. Um, 
And so as Sihao mentioned, uh, it was pretty, pretty immediately recognized that a long, uh, a long cooling delay on the order of eight giga years requires uh, something to do with NEON 22, probably. Uh, and just sort of writing out the sort of uh, tilde physics on a chalkboard, if you figure out, you know, we know roughly the luminosity of these white dwarfs. It's a very sharp feature on the eight, on the HR diagram. We know how long they need to maintain that luminosity. Uh, and so you need a total amount of energy uh, to power that, that luminosity for a long time. Uh, and that, it turns out that actually rules out kind of the normal cooling delay features that uh, we tend to think about for white dwarf cooling, like uh, crystallization and its latent heat that will give us some amount of cooling delay. But for these massive white dwarfs, it's really only about one gig a year. Um, so it's just, there's just not enough energy coming from the phase transition to explain this long of a cooling delay. Uh, and similarly, there's a, a long and interesting literature on phase separation uh, at the crystallization front between carbon and oxygen, where you end up with more uh, oxygen rich material uh, getting pushed toward the center of the white dwarf. And there is some energy associated with that, but it's just not enough to explain this long of a cooling delay. So what we're left with is um, needing heavier elements like neon 22 and uh, perhaps sodium 23 uh, to sediment toward the center and sort of release their gravitational energy as they do that. Um, so it turns out it works out that that will give you enough energy. Um, so neon 22 is probably present in, in white dwarf cores, uh, we think kind of at a level reflecting the initial metallicity of the stars that form these white dwarfs. Uh, and it has a few extra neutrons, um, and that effectively makes it a little heavier than the plasma surrounding it. So uh, in, in a white dwarf interior, there's an electrostatic field uh, because it turns out the ions don't really participate in setting hydrostatic balance so much. Uh, and so they need an electrostatic field to uh, set up kind of a neutral buoyancy for the average background ions like carbon and oxygen. Uh, and so it turns out that things that have a few extra neutrons end up sort of net heavy um, and they sink a little bit. And so neon 22, if it's able to sink fast enough, can release a lot of energy and perhaps power a long cooling delay. Um, but the problem with that is that uh, we think we understand neon 22 sedimentation pretty well. Uh, and the predictions that our models have made for a long time would say that neon 22 sinks pretty slowly. Um, if you just talk about individual ions, we know their diffusion coefficients, we know how fast they should sink. Uh, and so it turns out it takes much longer than a few giga years for neon 22 to sink all the way to the center and release all of its energy. So uh, in classic stellar evolution and classic white dwarf cooling models, you just don't see an eight giga year. You might see about a one giga year cooling delay. Um, and this, I think, is another thing that MESA models that I've made and La Plata models from Maria Kamisasa agree on, is that just the, the sort of standard picture is uh, not enough by itself for Neon 22 diffusion to explain uh, what's going on. Although it, it does seem like there are some uh, disagreements between the codes on exactly how long the cooling delay should be, so it, it, it'll be worth investing some effort to figure out um, why we have differences. But I would say both of our papers uh, tend to agree that if you just put in the standard prescriptions for neon 22 diffusion, you're not going to end up getting any of your cooling delay out. Um, and I should also say this, uh, this plot I've stolen from the version on archive, I think is a preliminary version and not the final version. Um, but Maria has a paper coming out soon on this. Uh, so I want to just quickly say uh, a few words about the proposals for what we think uh, might be happening to modify the delay times for some of these uh, white dwarf. So I had uh, a proposal that perhaps neon 22 particles could cluster together. That would cause them to form basically larger solid chunks that could sink faster, uh, greatly enhance the diffusion rate, and lead to a cooling delay um, on the order of several giga years rather than just one or two. Uh, Maria and her collaborators had a, a different interesting idea of just having greatly enhanced uh, neon 22 abundances. Uh, and of course, if there's more neon 22 around, it can lead to a much longer cooling delay. And so that perhaps could have something to do with uh, causing this anomaly on the Q branch. Um, but these two proposals, I think, both have problems that uh, will require some more work to understand if they'll really work out in detail. So uh, for the idea of clustering, actually, Matt Kaplan and, and uh, Chuck Horowitz uh, quickly responded with some molecular dynamic models. Um, uh, where they went in in detail and si simulated this idea of uh, neon 22 clusters in carbon oxygen mixtures. 
And it seems like their results indicate that those kinds of clusters would not be stable. And so uh, it might not be the case that we can really form these clusters to enhance the N22 uh, diffusion rates. Uh, and then for the idea of, of just much greater mass fractions of neon 22, uh, it's just very unclear if there's an astrophysical scenario that can really produce that much neon 22 in a white dwarf interior. So there has been some discussion of possibly white dwarf mergers, um, but I think there are a few problems with that um, that maybe I don't have total, uh, a, a lot of time to get into. One is that uh, uh, Josiah's recent models that he was discussing uh, seem to indicate that double white dwarf CO mergers will tend to ignite the carbon and uh, make oxygen neon white dwarf. So it might be hard to make this population actually out of out of white dwarf mergers. Um, but there may be more work or more ideas that we could come up with for how to enhance the amount of neon 22. Um, but one last proposal that I, I want to mention that just came out last week from Simone Bluon and collaborators at Los Alamos uh, that I, I'm very excited about. Uh, they look even closer at the three component phase diagram for carbon oxygen neon mixtures. Uh, and they pointed out actually a, a physical process I had never heard of before, but um, something that seems promising to me, they call it distillation. Uh, actually at the, uh, at the moment where this mixture of plasma is beginning to crystallize, they argue that for certain abundances of neon 22, it's possible that uh, crystals form that are depleted in neon 22. It's kind of counterintuitive. Neon is a higher charge element and you'd think it would crystallize sooner, but uh, for parts of the phase diagram, uh, that turns out not to be true apparently, according to their work. Um, and when you form a solid crystal that is depleted of the heavier element, it can actually be buoyant in the background mixture and float upward. Um, and then eventually melt, but that would lead to net transport that could be much faster than uh, our old school diffusion calculations. And so that could end up causing some subset of carbon oxygen white dwarfs to have a, a significant enhancement in neon transport that could maybe uh, explain this cooling delay. Uh, and I think one of the most interesting features of this model is it's very sensitive to the the abundances of all three components in a carbon oxygen neon mixture. And so there are qualitative differences between say standard carbon oxygen uh, white dwarfs with, uh, with neon 22 abundances that are roughly solar versus those that are just a little bit enriched by a factor of two uh, or even less. And so you might end up with a population that doesn't really get this big enhancement and a small population that does, which would ma nicely match see uh, how's. Uh, two parameter model. So uh, just a, a few points in conclusion. Uh, I, think, I think we're at the point of agreeing that there's something interesting with carbon oxygen cores going on, uh, uh, crystallization requiring that these massive white dwarfs have carbon oxygen. Um, and whatever is happening, is, it seems to probably involve uh, neon 22, but we still need to uh, come up with some, or better understand the, the physics of what is in what is happening with neon 22 uh, in, a, in a carbon oxygen background that allows it to cause such uh, a significant cooling delay. Um, so I think I'll leave it here and see how and I can take some questions. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Ilaria has her hand up first. Oh, hello. Uh, I have a question for Evan. So in, yours, um, in your model for the NEON 22, uh, what would be different about the 6%? Uh, like what, why would you have a smaller population that had that happening versus the big population, the normal? Uh, yeah, so I, I think it, in our model, we sort of argued that um, the ones that experience a really long cooling delay would probably be descended from higher metallicity progenitors. Uh, so there would be a, a continuum for sure um, in this physical process. Uh, and the ones that seem to make up this population of kind of an eight gig year would be uh, descended from the most metal rich that end up with the most neon 22. Um, so it's a, a little unclear how to map that exactly. I mean, so the statistics of, of see how his approach involves a, a simple two parameter model. Uh, and I think it'd be interesting to do the statistics more with sort of a, a continuum distribution of, of metallicities, but uh, it's not obvious, immediately obvious to me, at least how to map those two together. Thanks. Boris. Um, yeah, so very naive question. What's so special about neon? Because you said the neon is primordial. Um, 
And what about all the other stuff like that has that is present in large quantities like sulfur and magnesium and silicon and iron? Would they settle and add anything? Uh, yeah. Um, so I should have I should have specified. So neon actually reflects roughly the primordial metallicity overall. Uh, and I think I rushed over that point a little bit. So the, it's true that other heavy elements can, and can sediment and maybe cause a little bit of a cooling delay as well. But neon is actually descended from the primordial CNO. So the carbon and nitrogen oxygen, when it starts to go through the CNO cycle, it ends up as nitrogen. And then during helium burning, that alpha captures up, up to eventually neon 22. And so you just end up with a lot of it. That, it's going to be the most abundant thing that, that causes this kind of delay. Okay, uh, Pierre Emmanuel. Yeah, um, I think that's about ruling out uh, latent heat and uh, carbon uh, oxygen phase separation. Um, I think for, for the lower mass wide world that are not necessarily uh, mergers, um, I, I think this scenario of uh, regular crystallization could, could still work, however. Yes, yes, of course, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we, 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 we are not claiming that uh, crystallization does not happen or phase transition, uh, phase separation does not happen. Of, of, of course, not happens. It's just, our, yeah, just our argument is that for the, for the massive part of this branch, um, there seem to be uh, more happening. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Wolfgang. Hey, um, so, I mean, you know, there, there seem to be sort of three proposals, and I'm wondering what measurements, and maybe you mentioned this already, what measurements would rule each one of those out? I think, um, I think actually the, the narrowness of the branch is still something really hard to recover. Um, my impression is that for both uh, the like if, if you just naively in, uh, increase the diffusion coefficient or the abundance of neon 22, the position of the branch and the narrowness of the branch will change. Um, and and, and the, one, one beautiful thing about the, this feature is that it's a very narrow branch on the HR diagram. So that means really you need um, a very particular feature, uh, a physics uh, that, that, that is behind it. So I think my my personal impression is that the third one will be uh, most promising. The reason is that it's actually uh, saying that uh, uh, right before criticization happening in the core, uh, neon twenty two will will fall down to the center quickly due to the uh, distillation uh, mechanism. So that's what exactly we want. Is that we we want an effect which have a uh, very narrow range of temperature where it happens. Right, so I think the position, the, 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 uh, uh, the delay time, the position of the branch and the narrowness of the branch will be the observational factors. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's any, any other observations that you can sort of do like astro small, you can sort of make predictions which you then could rule out um, with measurements. I see. In addition, I, I see. In, the, in addition to HR diagrams. Yeah, so perhaps like atmosphere will not be helpful, right? Because the, the, the difference on uh, usually mainly in the interior. Uh, uh, Astrocyte smallness might help uh, like to determine the fraction of, of uh, crystallization in, in, in the interior. But my impression is that the accuracy is still not high enough to confidently say the, what, what's a fraction of, of the white dwarf that is crystallized. Do you think it would be really fascinating to get some more astroseismological studies of, of massive white dwarfs around crystallization? Um, so I'm, I'm not aware yet if we really have enough observations that can constrain these kinds of things, but I, uh, hypothetically, it might be possible to find a few that we could really study in detail and try to infer the properties of the interior and uh, you know possibly sort of where the crystallization front might be. Um, yeah, but I'd, I'd have to defer to astro seismology experts about whether that's actually feasible to find those sorts of massive white dwarfs. Thank you, Sihao and Evan. <laughs>
All right, and one last, hopefully, quick question from Peter. Hi, yeah, uh, for Evan. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking this is a small fraction of all white dwarves, and if it comes from some kind of uh, higher metallicity, uh, uh, I'm thinking of like NGC 6791, which has three times uh, solar abundance, but is an old cluster and possibly a galaxy that was actually torn apart. Could could we just be looking at some uh, merger event in the galaxy, and, and these are the, now the white dwarves that are passing through this uh, clump? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I think it is degenerate with some very interesting sort of old stellar history that could be hard to disentangle, right? With, um, you know, it, it has something to do with metallicity that is required to form the Neon 22. Um, and if there's, you know, an interesting star formation history uh, and that, you know, you end up with some small population with a very long cooling delay. So, yeah, I think uh, in my paper, we had some discussion of, of NGC 6791. Um, that was an interesting thing to kind of try to work through and understand. Um, I, I think what we came away with was a little bit surprising in that NGC 6791 clearly does have a pretty substantial cooling delay uh, in the white dwarf population there. Um, but one thing it doesn't really rule out is a cooling delay that goes on for many more giga years. <laughs> Um, because, you know, it has a particular age that you can measure from the main sequ sequence turnoff and other things. Um, and so it ends up not really necessarily being constraining for this kind of physics, if you want to talk about something that might have, say, an 8 or 10 giga year cooling delay because the, the cluster is only 8 giga years old. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting one to look at, though. Well, thank you both. That was a very interesting talk. Fox. All right. Uh, thank you, Sia and Evan, and thanks to the other speakers in the session. Um, we're a little behind on time, but we're going to be starting right at 10 o'clock, or sorry, in 17 minutes. Uh, so see you all then. Have a good break.